Steph, you are so welcome to the Happy at Work podcast. I'm absolutely thrilled to have you as my guest today. Do you want to give listeners a little bit about your background, a flavor for what it is that you do and maybe touch on what we're going to talk about today? Yeah, lovely. And firstly, thank you so much for asking me. I, I'm loving your podcasts and we share a lot of uh, commonality. So I've been really excited about coming and talking to you today. So where do I start? OK, so there's two sides to me. <laughs> my day job is a head of HR role in a company that most people have never heard of. Uh, we're a little company that tries to do huge things. We're called Retail in Motion. And we're basically trying to change uh, how people experience travel. So when you're on a plane, how you will experience us is you'll either be buying food that we sourced or we'll be engaging with you using our technology. So the crew will hold a handset and everything through that handset we've either developed or, or purchased. And we run the whole end to end process for retail for um, an airline. So we literally run the, the, the shop in the sky for yeah. some uh, for some um, airlines, but for other airlines, they just buy a piece of what we do. And um, then my other job, my side hustle, as we call it, is uh, Step B. And it started really as a place or a space to share my passion, which is people and also kind of self-development and self-potential and then I did a lot of training and I've turned it into like a little mini business and my company are very kind and they let me play with both at the same time yeah um which probably will add into later on how why I'm happy in work <laughs> sorry one of the reasons <laughs> that my company let me do and be who I need to be yeah um so yeah so that's the day job and the side hustle I've been in retail and motion for nearly nine years and every day is different and every day it's changing and COVID hit us really, really hard. So okay, yeah, another, of course. Another journey. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, the entire travel industry pretty much obliterated overnight. Um, and it's funny, like we were saying just before we started recording that I was checking my credit card bill the other day and I saw a little thing saying retail in motion. And I thought uh, somehow Steph B has uh, crawled into my credit card and started spending money uh, for her company on my behalf. And uh, I realized it was actually it was exactly that. It was um, a transaction that that was on um, on Aer Lingus, I think it was. And um, that's actually what it was. And that made me realize then what it is that that you do in your organization. So it's really interesting. Um, so we're before we start, company. sorry, go on. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say we're a tiny company. People have never heard of us, but we are global. And yeah. Most airlines in the world we do something for. OK, yeah, 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 yeah. That's brilliant. Yeah. Like a huge yeah. success story as well. It is. It's a David and Goliath thing as well. You know, there's a, a small gang of scrappy entrepreneurs, you know, back yeah. in 2011, <laughs> 12, 13. And, and yeah, <laughs> love it. Love it. And Steph, I know that you, you you mentioned that you've been there for nearly nine years and you've sort of been there from the start, like you say, from scrappy entrepreneurs and taking it to this kind of global. I'm not going to say giant because you're saying it's a small company, but you've taken it from this kind of small startup scrappy type of thing into what it is today. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about that journey? And I know before we started recording, we talked about the importance of belonging and creating that sense of belonging in an organization. Yeah. So I suppose when I joined Retail Emotion, I, I really wasn't sure it was for me. I'd just been made redundant and I planned to take some time off with my brand new little girl uh, who I would fought for. Like uh, we had years of IVF and that's something else I'll, I'll maybe talk about later with the whole belonging piece. Um, so I wanted some time off, but I was very lucky The people I'd worked with before, uh, a few uh, a few of them had gone to different companies and I got calls from like, three different companies and Retail Emotion was one of them. So I went and see them and I was like, these guys are mad, but I kind of liked it, like mad. And yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Um, I loved their ambition. And I loved why they were they were just trying things and they kind of were OK with me not having all the like I had no aviation experience or tech experience. Mm. What I did have was great HR experience and retail. Yeah, but um, I think I think sometimes that's good. Like, sorry to kind of cut in, but I think sometimes it's really great to come to an industry without industry experience because you're bringing that new perspective. Yes. And curiosity and curiosity yeah, huge to learn. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. I'm, I'm always the one in the room asking the questions. I have no shame in yeah. asking a question. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll have a joke about it. I'll have fun about it because I want everybody around me to know it's OK to ask questions, because if I don't know the answer, there's surely somebody else in the room that doesn't know the answer. And I know that's really 
cliche, but it's true. And I love calling out that elephant in the room, that thing yeah. that nobody's talking about. Like I get great fun out of it. Yeah. Um, I've been to do that for nine years in RIM. Um, you know, so it's something I really encourage for people coming into our industry. That curiosity is really important because nobody will come in with everything we do with tech, retail and aviation. I mean, yeah, those are those people are unicorns. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Get one. Great. And we'll teach the rest. But it takes it took me a good year, good year, year and a half to really understand what we do because it's so complex um, and yeah, just so complex and how we do it is so complex. So, so yeah, so I joined, it was tiny and we had nothing like there wasn't even a filing cabinet for employees and that, and that really attracted me to, so I could go in and figure it out myself and yeah. try everything and it's scary, but like also very exciting. Um, but there was no benefits. The salaries were dreadful. So I had nothing really to work with. Um, and it's still very difficult because like I said, we're still, we're very small and we're fighting for in this war of talent. Google are coming in and knocking on the door of our people, Microsoft, mm. Amazon. I mean, we're losing our people to huge organizations and I don't have the weapons to keep them, but I do mm. have one great weapon, which is belonging. Yeah. That was something I recognized really early. I felt like I had worked there forever by day three. And that is really unusual. The yeah. welcome I got was phenomenal. Even though it was small, even though there was so much to do, people really, really cared about each other. And it sounds again corny to say it was like a family, but it is a bit like a family. Like there's so much laughing and a, a bit of chaos because we're always trying to do things that are bigger than we are. Um, but there was great camaraderie. And it's one place where I would say, say, for example, on our exec team right now, I know that every single person on our exec team has my back for sure guaranteed mm. like, and yeah. there's no doubt for me there's no doubt there's not one of them that would throw me under a bus so there's none of that politics which again for me is very freeing and um very heartwarming so really i i felt belonging and i started saying right okay nobody knows about us i had to, i think we had to hire 100 people in that first year i was there and it was just me in hr Luckily, uh, my my very dear colleague, uh, Cora, joined me within a couple of months. She was working in another part of the company and she joined me. But between the two of us, we hired 100 people that first year and nobody knew who we were. Wow. So I had to get us on the map. And I was like, well, how do we get us on the map? And I went on the whole journey of employer branding, which we very luckily won an award for last week or two weeks ago. Oh, I did see that. Yes. Yeah, you posted on, on uh, Instagram about that. So congratulations. Well done very chuffed about it because it really was a kind of um oh like a passion project i suppose from the very get-go i mean when i joined there our linkedin had 100 followers and it was being run by a guy that had been fired a couple of months before i joined i was like okay this is, really bad. This is like there's nothing so um so we really started with nothing and we had no money we never had a budget for anything and you know now we've got 20 something thousand followers everybody finds us through our linkedin and through our youtube so it was a real passion project. And what we really did was we wanted to name what you experience in RIM. And for me, it was the belonging. So if you look at our YouTube videos, you'll see they're so much fun. We have so much crack filming them and they're very us. Yeah. Um, they're very quirky. They're very us and they're very heartwarming at times or they're funny, um, but we're very much who we are. And so, yeah, I saw it as both an opportunity and a weapon in that war for talent. Hmm. I don't have lots of other things. So people would choose us over a Google because they were like, they might be offering me I don't know, five grand more, but I know I'm gonna learn more here. I'm gonna get more exposure here. And I'm gonna yeah. have one here. So I guess that's where the whole belonging started. And then it just morphed from there into yeah. for employer branding, into how do I, how do I figure this out as we get bigger? That was hard, you know? Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. Know, there's 40, but yeah. there's 250 and also all over the world. So that was a real challenge for me pre COVID. We had bits and bobs of people all over the world, not like a substantial office where you would go and set up a belonging, you know, culture, just like we had mm -hmm. in Dublin. We'd have maybe three people in America, you know, two people in Switzerland, a uh, handful of people in Italy. So again, it wasn't easy pre COVID yeah. to understand how to give them that belonging that they, that we wanted them to have. Yeah. And were they doing that remotely, essentially, like were they working from home in those locations? Presumably you weren't paying for an office for like for two people to go into. 
No, no, we've been doing remote working for years. We've been doing yeah. flexible working for years. We've been doing home working for our own people for years. So all this that came along for COVID, yeah, when it was a bit of a shock to a system to have the whole company working from home. But we have that culture of, um, I mean, I used to work two days a week from home. When I took the job, um, they offered me two days a week from home. So um, obviously I, I took that. Yeah, <laughs> you're like big, happy days. Factor. Yeah, it was a big factor for me taking the job. So, so we already had experience in that. I mean, we didn't expect to have to do it for so long. And Dublin, the office was always a place where you came to and felt like you belonged but early days in covid we said we would go remote first with a home yeah early dublin and we got um, an office in cologne as well also an amazing culture so we said like they'd be our homes but we got remote first and so that's what we did early days because people were asking me from the very start what happens how do i what's going to happen after covid uh, you know that was like like month two or month three so we said let's get ahead of this and just do yeah yeah remote first I mean, there's so much to unpack there. And I, I suppose like, I mean, one of the things that springs to mind before we go into the, the kind of bigger concept of belonging is the fact that you're owned by a, a massive, massive company. And what impact does that have? Or does it have any impact? It, it just, yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't. Again, that's been a journey too. So hmm. they bought they, they bought 40% of the shares just before I joined. And the, the guy who owned it at the time was struggling with that, with having sold 40% of his baby. Yeah. And his <laughs> culture and their culture were so different. And then uh, the plan was to sell the rest of the company later on, but that sale was brought forward. So, I um, mean, I had no experience of M&A or of uh, being taken over, bought over. So that was a massive learning journey. And it wasn't easy. Uh, but what they decided was that they would ring fence us so that they didn't you know do the typical come in take over a company and then ruin that company um, <laughs> yeah. and they did that really well and and they really and another thing i love about my place is you have a voice so i have a voice at the table you know i have a voice with with lsg our mother company and it's nice to know you've got that voice um doesn't mean you'll always get things your own way uh, uh, you know i don't want ever people to think that but you could be in the company two days and you've got a voice um, you know, we hire you in for a reason and we want to hear your opinion, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so the first couple of years, it was okay. The only parts of the company that really felt it were finance and HR, which is normal. But again, I had real uh, voice and power to say, no, that's not going to work for us. And no, mm. you said we were ring fenced. Uh, yeah. Okay. We'll do that bit. Cause that makes sense. You know, now over COVID that's changed quite a lot uh, because our position in the company has really changed. Um, it's very difficult for our mother company at the moment because they're a manufacturing company and, um, you know, and we're IT. So even though we had a, a big hit at the start of COVID, the airlines actually needed us more as time went on because we were enabling contactless. Okay, yeah, yeah. So we enable people not to use cash on a plane. We mm. enable, um, you know, purchasing over the web, pre-order. Pre yeah, and them. there's, there's, but there's no cash on planes anymore. It used to be like, our, you know, it's, I traveled for the first time in January, I think in about three years. And I'm sure prior to that, it was it was OK to use cash and you were getting your change and all the rest. But now it's like, no, we don't accept cash anymore. It's just the contactless card, you know, the the you know, it's well, it's yeah. that's a whole other story for another day. How easy it is just to tap, <laughs> tap your card and spend oh, money. Right. <laughs> Yeah, so we enable all that. So the airlines needed us more. And also, obviously, they lost so much money and we enable a revenue. So we're revenue driving. Mm. We're our mother company. It's complementary catering. So, okay. yeah, so they've been hit a lot harder than we have. So so our position in the company has changed quite a bit. Being OK, a bit more, a bit more powerful. We were yeah. you know, pre-COVID, which means then the relationship has to change as yeah. well. So yeah. yes, they are a lot closer. We are a lot tighter because we're kind of in this together as well, right? So yeah. we're in this trying to figure out what's the future of our company look like in this new landscape, um, you know, and, and for us, it looks good. Um, you know, we're hiring 80 odd people at the moment. Um, wow. Very difficult in the current environment. Again, when mm. we're fighting with the Googles and the MasterCards yeah. and the Amazons for, for staff. But um, my colleagues are in the same position. They're looking for lorry drivers in America. You can't get a lorry driver. You know, you cannot get yeah. a driver. So so we've got very similar problems, even though they're with, in slightly different ways of looking at them. Yeah, know? slightly different contexts, but it's still, yeah, it's still yeah. a real challenge. Yeah. yeah. Um. I mean, that kind of brings us back to this idea of this, you know, the the kind of weapon that you said that you have, which is the sense of belonging. How 
maybe let's talk about what belonging actually means. Let's kind of maybe go back to the start. Like, what does belonging really mean to you? And then we, we could talk about, like, how do you do that? And then even building on that, how do you do that then in this remote environment? Yeah, oh God, there's so much there. Uh, so yes, I know. Uh, this, that would be the rest of the podcast. Sure. Of. <laughs> well, I mean, I feel like you, I've worked in places where I haven't belonged and it yeah. feels like I'm wearing a suit that doesn't fit me very well and it's uncomfortable and I guess I feel judged and I don't like feeling judged. The imposter syndrome is big when you don't yeah. belong. Yeah. It's not a psychologically safe space. You know, you don't take risks. It's harder to learn and to grow. So I knew what belonging didn't feel like. And also I moved to Ireland when I was five and I never felt like I belonged for a long time. So as okay. a child, belonging was very difficult for me. Yeah. But when I find it, I'm like, ooh, this is this is nice. <laughs> so I guess it feels like coming home and also that I can be the best version of myself, but also I can be like authentically myself. And that is so important to me. But that's probably one of the reasons I'm still in RIM for nine years, apart from the fact that I love my job and I, I, I love the challenges and I've learned so much. And learning is such an important part of my job for me. It, 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 you know, in the old days when I was retail, as soon as I got bored, CV was being typed. Right. And I never get bored <laughs> in RIM like ever. <laughs> Always yeah. something challenged me. Um, and so I guess that's what belonging is for me, you know, where I can be myself. I can share things. I can go to somebody and go this is hard. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. And you don't get that everywhere. So yeah. I got that in RIM from the start. Uh, I found it hard to lean into it for a while. So like when I got the job at the start, you know, I, I think my title was HR director and I was like, oh man, I don't know if I can do this. You know, yeah, um, yeah. are you sure you picked the right girl here? <laughs> um, and you know, the usual imposter syndrome. So I don't think I lent into it for a while. But then I did um, a couple of great courses at the same time. I had a couple of great opportunities. Um, Lufthansa put me on one of their uh, high performance um, leadership uh, training groups. Phenomenal. Um, and it literally changed my life. And uh, I really understood who I was and where my strengths were, you know. Um, at the same time, RIM allowed me to get an external coach. So he was working with me at the same time. And then from all that work, I went on to become a coach myself. So again, there was a whole other growth journey there. So I guess within all that, then I started really leaning into, you know, that authenticity and that psychological safety and being able to have the right vocabulary to ask for the right help. And that's really something I'm passionate about now with my own clients, you know, both my internal and external clients is giving them the vocabulary to ask for the right help, but also the right environment for them to thrive. And I guess that's what I get in REM. And I was able to finally put it into words through those wonderful uh, courses that I was on that's what I get every day and I can ask people if I need to every day or I can offer the right help not blanket help that you do when you're not as confident I mm. can go well like I'm terrible at that but that I can really help you with you know? yeah yeah you yeah understand where you know you add value and actually that gives me a buzz like all day every day because you come out of your day feeling like you've had a good day even if you're doing really hard things yeah and I think that's what I got in REM and then also, I think the other piece is values. So, you know, as a coach, um, we understand how important values are um, and it's a huge piece of work we do. So what I did in RIM was I took the learnings I had as a coach and we, we did an amazing exercise just pre-COVID. We literally launched it just pre-COVID where we completely redid our company values, uh, vi vision and mission. And we were so excited about it. It had been done from uh, the employees upwards. Mm -hmm. And oh, we were so excited. And then COVID hit. We actually did uh, launch parties all around the world, which we'd never done before. Yeah. And uh, so what I did was I started teaching people values, like the room values. And that was okay. That was a good session. But then I figured out, hang on, where do you get real belonging is where you understand where your values connect with the room values. So Absolutely. I yeah. Took a totally different approach. And, and I'm thrilled with it because um, we do interviews with our new starters when they're six weeks in see how they're doing and what we could do better in every element of their um you know interviewing onboarding attraction and one thing i've been told they love is the value session that they have with me so what i do is i go through what their values are and i really have a great exercise i bring them through we spend about two hours on it working through so they can identify their core five values and then i bring them through the rim values and i get them to connect them because 
you know, most values have some sort of similarities. You know, all yeah. Values. Um, and that for me is much more effective is seeing how you connect with the RIM values rather than saying, here's the RIM values. Um, now go off. off you yeah, go. go and figure figure it out yourself kind yeah. of thing. How, yeah. How them? Like, yeah. So I think it's much more effective and it really shows them that they can belong uh, once they have an understanding of how they adapt the RIM values for them and how they can live in their values. Because most people don't know what their values are. They say things, you know, we all say things like, oh, fairness and trust but really what are your top five values? Mm. Um, so I get them down to their top five and then I show them how to live in their values every day and you know what to do when you're not living in your values and how to put the vocabulary on it. Um, so I think that really helps the belonging. And then I guess for myself, I've got my values written on my computer right here and I look at them every day to yeah. check, check in, you know, and particularly in the hard times, you know, when you're writing that email that to the person that's really driven you crazy, you know the emails <laughs> you're not supposed to send. <laughs> <laughs> is 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 are you trying to tap in now to your value of kindness and yeah, being saying exactly, like I yeah. need to really be kind to yeah, this yeah, person yeah. when I'm responding? Yeah. But that's the thing. Like, are you you know because your values are only as good as if you're living them. So exactly, if I yeah. am cross. If I am having a day, I'll check in my values and go, okay, am I responding that way? Well, then no. Then we need to just take a take a moment. Yeah. So they all make me feel like I belong because I can do that. I can live in my values. I, I you need you I need to close down your emails and and think about responding another time. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, yeah 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 so but I think, I think off track there but no not at all no I think everything that you're talking about is brilliant and like totally ties in with everything that I believe in as well and I love your approach of making it real for the people in the organization because you know for me like this is kind of a, a parallel concept but it's about making the expectations clear about like what is the expectation in this organization and making making it obvious the direct link between what people do on a day to day basis and the success of the company. It's the same with values, you know, making that link a bit more obvious to people about what they do and how they behave on a day to day basis and how what the expectation is around that behavior and how they can then make that link for themselves. I think it's it's really, really important. And going back maybe to the original point of this you know, competing and there's a, you know, you're not alone in competing with the likes of Google and, you know, the likes of these large <laughs> global organizations that have money and they have, you know, people know about them. You were saying like people don't necessarily know about your organization. So there's all of these things that you're competing with, but you're so right in saying if you create that atmosphere for people, they're not necessarily going to get that same thing within the likes of Google. Like I know Google do do yeah. work on their values and things like that. But once you find somewhere where you really feel like you belong, it's more likely that you're going to stay with that organization rather than taking the risk that maybe you won't feel that same way within, you know, um, uh, that you won't feel that same way for five grand more actually is a is it worth it, you know? Exactly. I think when you get to a certain level, it, it is the five and ten grand. I mean, like, OK, some of uh, my team are leaving right now because their salaries have been doubled by these huge companies. They can't turn that down. They're young and they're establishing themselves and they have to they have to take that opportunity. It's right for them right now. But for yeah. me, it might be ten grand after tax five. Am I going to take that risk? Probably not. Yeah. Because yeah. I know what works for me now because I've done the work. Right. Yeah. So exactly. One thing I'm trying to do in RIM is, and actually you said something earlier, which is very difficult. So COVID, that belonging, it's really hard. Yeah. It's really hard. So just like I had pre-COVID with the, the, the people spread around the world, which actually Slack really helped us with. We didn't have Slack and we got Slack in and that helped us pull people closer. And also what I, what I started doing pre-COVID was I would do workshops with either all remote people or all people in the room i found when i was doing like half remote half in the room I like hybrid yeah it's hard focus. yeah i was yeah. either focusing on the room people or focusing on the computer people and i yeah. couldn't do both so i learned a few tricks pre-covid but it is really hard to have that i mean in our office just you'd laugh hard every day mm. there's always messing and joking going on we do really hard things with some quite hard clients so it's nice to go into a room and Literally, somebody walked past my room and say, she needs a hug today and would walk in and just give me a hug because they yeah. said it was great. That's the kind of office we had. Dogs and kids randomly in the office. Like, it was lovely, like, um, and that's hard to get back. So we need now this year to figure out how do we create that environment 
maybe not all the time maybe regularly right yeah so you yeah often experience that and it fills you up for a week a month whatever it is your choice yeah yeah, um, yeah. we've got to figure that out yeah that has been really difficult and I haven't figured it out yet yeah well I was going to ask like so have you done anything around or or I suppose the question kind of is how did you maintain that culture you're saying it was difficult but was it possible in any way to maintain that culture when you were remote you so you had this wonderful culture there were some people who were already working remote but all of a sudden overnight everyone is working remotely and now the policy is remote first but you know with the, bringing people together on occasion to kind of celebrate the wins and to to build a team and stuff like that first year was easier so the first year we did a great thing at christmas time uh, I think I called it a calendar of joy and joy is one of our, our values. And we had like literally um, high, events all through the calendar, everything from um, our CTO was running like a, a pub quiz. I was reading stories to kids, uh, which was great crack, by the way. I would highly recommend that to anybody. If you want to have some fun, read stories to kids um, on Zoom. And okay. um, Love it. Uh, we had like baking competitions, our CEO, and our head of uh, I would love that now I have to say we did loads <laughs> of stuff uh, I have to say year two HR were exhausted we were absolutely yeah. exhausted yeah uh, because we're the ones always doing that kind of stuff now we did start a book club at the very start of COVID that is mm. still going strong and we've got people from all over the world in our book club and there is such a sense of longing in our book, book club meeting every month so so we've actually we've managed it in pockets um, but I did find that the people who knew each other before COVID found it easier to get into this online community. Yeah, 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 yeah. Who joined us mid COVID. That was much yeah. harder. Yeah. Them. Yeah. So, yeah, pockets of it. But I, we certainly, we were, HR, we were exhausted by the second Christmas. There was like, it was hard to dig in and get that joy, particularly when people weren't turning up to stuff that you were creating, you know, because they were done with Zoom too. They were like, we're so Zoomed out. Yeah. Um, so we did manage it, but only in pockets. So I'm not going to pretend we did it better than anybody else. If if anyone listening hears a cat in the background, you are <laughs> correct. I'm, I'm currently cat sitting for a friend and I thought I had the door closed, but apparently not. Um, I have a cat joining me and rubbing up against me and... Oh, now yeah, I, there I, we go I making noise yet, <laughs> yeah um oh yeah i think she's just trying to get my attention but uh that's the joys anyway zoom. Of, of zoom and keeping it real um <laughs> for, anyway <laughs> uh so back back to the podcast um no that's brilliant i mean and and everything that you're you're kind of talking about you you mentioned that that one of the values is joy what are some of the other values or what are all of the other values that you have at retail emotion yeah, so uh, joy, making a difference, uh, respect and ownership. And what we've done is um, we did a thing called operationalizing the values. So um, I have always said I failed if they're just a poster on a wall. So that's yeah, the of course. I do the value sessions with every uh, new starter. So uh, as part of the induction week, they have an hour or two with me doing values. But I also do a quarterly values check. And so if people want to come back in, double check the values, ask me any questions um you know challenge the values like yeah not they can yeah i'll do my best <laughs> but yeah uh, so that's why i keep those value sessions alive but also we operationalize them so what i did was i did workshops and actually i was really impressed and this is pre-covid you know i nerd out about values right because i get them but i always think that not for everybody <laughs> a lot of people i roll at this stuff right uh, but i did these workshops where i invited everybody in the company in and I said, what I wanted them to do was, okay, we had the words, we all had agreed on the words and the exec team said, yeah, yeah, I like the words that you guys have come up with. But like, what does that mean? What do the words mean? So I got them all to go off in pairs and tell me what each value, if what does somebody look like, walk like, talk like, smell like, who says that is their value? Tell me what they look like. And so all of the employees did that. And loads of them came to these workshops. I think I did like 13 workshops, 13, 14 workshops with maybe 15, I, I don't know, I did loads of them, did remote ones as well. The remote ones were so well attended as well. So people really cared and really had an interest. Um, so we had a long list per value of what the operationalized values uh, were. And now that's something as well I go through in my value session is um, not just the words, like 
the words of the words, but let's take your top five values and go against each of the things on the list of the oper operationalized values. And how does your word connect with that? So you might connect with the word joy, but you mm -hmm. might connect with some of the things in the word joy. Yeah, 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 that it's, yeah, if you find like, I mean, fun kind of could connect with joy, you know, yeah. depending. And, and, and I always think the words, not not that the words are meaningless, yeah. but it's a, it's exactly as you say, it's the description and what does that actually mean and what is the behavior and what is the action and what is the decision associated with joy? So, you know, if you're having a bad day, joy means well, geez, it looks like Steph is having a bad day. Why don't I go in and bring a bit of joy by giving her a hug? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's. And it also that's... restarts the self-awareness journey as well. So the value mm. session. So so for me, again, if we go to, you know, what does happiness mean for me and for work? Resilience and positivity, right? And where do they start with self-awareness? So the value session would really get you to check in. Well, do yeah. I do this all the time? Am I at like 50% or 90% or what who am i when things are tough i mean that's a really interesting question to ask yourself yeah. you know, who am i when things aren't going my way um am i still living in my values because most of us would struggle and it's that's really where happiness starts coming in where i, I talk a lot about my baseline of positivity and resilience i don't believe in this toxic positivity but as i've done all this work on myself my baseline is higher so mm. when something happens i don't fall as far or for as long and for me, again, values are a great way to start working on those baselines. Yeah, that's it's so I'm funny. Thinking. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. And I love that. And it is exactly that. Who am I when things are tough? So it's not just about when things are are smooth and easy. It's thinking about, well, who who am I really? And, you know, sometimes we go to the extreme and we focus on the who am I and, you know, kind of be real negative about ourselves. But actually what other people see is mostly the positive side of things. They don't know what's necessarily going on in your head. They're not going. <laughs> Steph is going to write me a really nasty email now. They're just the recipient of this lovely, pleasant email that you've sent a day later than what you had originally yeah. planned. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's so it's so interesting, everything. And and like one of the things with values is I always worked in organizations that that had values and and some of the values were really obvious. Some of them were were lived and really clear mm. and and then others maybe not the lived experience or kind of almost a joke because like, you know, I think one organization I worked in, the, the value was simple, but similar to yourself, Steph, it kind of takes about an, a year and a half to get up to speed with everything because it's so such a complex organization. Um, and people used to kind of laugh at that and say, well, we're anything but simple. You know, it's, it's such a bureaucratic organization as well. So um, but it wasn't really until I did, again, my own work on myself and, and the coaching diploma that I did that I fully understood what values were. And then when I went on to do the research as part of the master's, the the importance of values in organizations really clicked and exactly that alignment. And it's not just about um, what the values are for for one person or what the values are of the organization, but finding that alignment between your own personal core values and the values within the organization. So so it's so interesting what you say. Um, is there anything that you want to share in terms of like the future, what the future might look like, um, how to maintain that culture in this kind of more hybrid environment or any thoughts or advice for anyone who's listening today? Well, I also think culture is a very movable thing. Um, so as proud as I was of our original culture, I'm always looking at the future. So I'm a very forward thinking person. I think that's why I'm a coach, right? We're all about forward, moving <laughs> forward. Um, and I think it's time to press reset. So okay. I think we're looking at the new the new era of, of retail emotion. You know, we've lost a lot of the um, original guys uh, through COVID um, and this great resignation. And also RIM is, is full on. You know, and I suppose yeah. people need to break from it and then they'll mm. come back. And we really want people to go um, with our blessing and then yeah. come back later. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. When you've got a breather, when you've got more. But they, they can be your biggest advocates if you give them, a, you know, rather than being bitter about it and, you know, kind of making things a bit awkward for them or not giving them a good recommendation or anything like that. If you're if you actually give them a good send off and happy to recommend them, then, you know, they could be the boomerang, you know, that they come back in the end or they they can be your biggest advocates that if you're looking for people, they can recommend other people to work there because they know how great of a place it is to work. 
Yeah, exactly. And I'm doing um, a, a thing at the moment. So we're um, doing a lot around sustainability, which I'm absolutely loving. We're doing it properly as well. So we've got a full on, um, we've got a full, full time sustainability people, which is quite a luxury in, in an environment where, you know, cost is an issue for us all the time. But we believe in it so much um, mm. so that we've, we've resourced it. And obviously I'm leading the people um, part of sustainability. And um, uh, we're doing a load around diversity and all that kind of thing. But one thing I'm doing as part of the diversity is we've set up a, a women's networking, you know, and an engagement sort of um, um, power up group, I would call them, you know. Um, and one thing I've said to them very clearly is, um, please apply, even if you're thinking of leaving room, because what I want you to do is not just leave room for anything, but leave room for the perfect thing for you. Um, because we owe you that. And it'd be nice to be able to give you that um, because we'd love you to come back. So at the end of this power up course, it's a it's a six week uh, or sorry, six session course. You should know what it is you want out of life and know how to ask for it and know what your real goals are, know what you really want. And it might not be rim and that's OK. So mm. we've, made that, we've made that really clear. And I'm yeah. the blessed the full exec team. You know, we're yeah. not holding you hostage here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not that. Yes. It's not the golden handcuffs. It's not like, oh, well, you've we've put you through this course and therefore you should feel. And this is, again, this, you know, going back with my research hat on this idea of commitment and feeling obliged to stay in an organization is not a good way to get the most out of people or to help them to feel fulfilled or feel a sense of meaning and purpose in the work that they do. They just feel like I'm staying here because they paid for this or mm -hmm. they put on this amazing um, development program for me and now I feel like I have to stay because I've taken part in it you know exactly. yeah I was talking to a, a fellow coach this week he works in my mother company LSG and we we always think the same about everything and we were talking about this feeling of, of volunteering which again really leads into belonging so we know this is tough right now and it's I think it's very stressful when you've got one foot out of the door when you're like oh will I stay will I go will I stay will I go and I've decided I'm staying because I know there's so much learning for me Mm -hmm. it is still my baby right it's still yeah. that baby company that I created but still I mean you know um there's some loyalty but it's not all about loyalty it's about looking at what I need as well but honestly when you make that decision to stay or go it's really it's really light you feel much yeah light. it's freeing yeah 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 freeing. That's yeah, the word. yeah and we were talking about that and this concept of volunteering like this is a battle where it's hard we're in aviation straight after COVID it's not easy and there's a now a Russian crisis going on, which is also affecting aviation. Yeah. So it's not easy. But when you decide it's not easy, but I'm going to do it anyway, that's very freeing. And yeah. so I liked that idea of volunteering. And that's what we need to do is encourage people to volunteer, you know, to um, to volunteer to be in this fight with us, not to feel like they have to be because of, like you say, uh, we've put you on a course or, you know, we're, we're giving you your attention. Um, are you up for this? You know, are you going to join us and imagine how we'll feel at the other side of this yeah that's you know this it, what it brings to mind for me is you're you're kind of you're paying people you know back in the day you were paying people for their hands because most of the labor was manual you're in a factory you're in a um in a farm or something like that and now you're paying people for their heads yes. but you're not necessarily getting all of their heads because they're you know they can give discretionary effort, yes. discretionary effort and all the rest but really what you're talking about there stuff is for people to volunteer their hearts yeah. you know to really buy into what it is that you're doing as an organization and i think that's that's really what we're trying to get to is that people from an organizational perspective that it's that the organizations are filled with people who really care about what it is that you're trying to do um you know and 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 i suppose on, on the kind of bigger picture it, it brings it back to making sure that you are doing the right thing that you are doing something that you the impact that you're having in the world is positive that it's not necessarily um kind of a, a negative impact on the world um, is there anything else that we kind of haven't covered in relation to belonging that you want to talk about that you want to kind of cover? Well, there's probably one thing that's very close to my heart. And again, I was very lucky to be allowed to do it in Retail Emotion is the whole fertility thing. Oh, so yes. Yeah. I was very lucky when I was going through my fertility journey. I worked for um, Dixon's Curries and PC World and I actually had two male bosses while I was going through the, the whole process. And I was really open about it because that's just who I am. Um, and I've, I, I couldn't get over the support and the love, not just support, but the love I got. And I don't think I'd have Sophie if it wasn't for them, because I don't think I would have had the energy to keep going. Um, because when you're trying to hide it from work 
or you've got a difficult workplace, which a lot of my followers have talked to me about, you know, the energy to do that next set of IVF is, is difficult. Um, so when I was in retail emotion and once I kind of got kind of comfortable with, with sharing my story, um, I asked them, would it be okay if I launched a fertility policy in work? And they were not just, it wasn't just a yes from the exec team. It was like a hell yes. In fact, Brilliant. one of the gentlemen I spoke to started crying as soon as I mentioned it to him because he'd also had a very hard journey, which he had to share to people. And we're just a very, just a very nice exec team. Like they're all young and they all, yeah. they're very family focused. So we launched that. <laughs> Your cat is- This is, this is the cat. Fun. Yeah. Wow. Fun times. Cats, like they just don't want you to be on, uh, looking at anything except them. Clearly not, clearly not. <laughs> um, and then this year we launched a surrogacy policy, which is a lot more challenging because there's, there's just no legal entitlement. Uh, but we gave um, anybody in our company who's going through it um, everything that they would possibly need, you know, um, le paid leave and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we also made it um, uh, applicable to any kind of family. So, you know, um, LGBTQ, single mom, single dad, mm. whatever, whatever your yeah. family is, uh, our policy will cover you. So that I was very proud of, but that also for me is a sign of belonging, you know? Yeah. So you, no matter what you're going through, you've got to you can have a home with us you know but it's like you've kind of by talking about your own journey you've given permission to other people to talk about their journey as well like you know that man you you talked about who, who kind of started crying because of it you know it you've in sharing your journey you've given him permission to talk about that you've you've brought it to the fore you are already in that psychologically safe environment. So it's not a case of like, you're going to get brushed off, or you're going to get dismissed by someone for, for bringing that up or for talking about it. So, you know, fair play for you to you for, for bringing it up and for creating that kind of environment where it is safe to do that as well. That's the other side of it. And I write a bit about the other side. Uh, people are scared of yeah. managing people who are fertility problems, because what if they're not doing their job? So I've written about that, about how you manage somebody going through a fertility journey, which you can actually apply to any difficult journey because you can manage them. You can. Yeah, yeah, you know. yeah, yeah, yeah. It could I apply, I suppose, to things like grief or, you know, yeah. other kind of maybe relationship issues, marital breakdown, all of that kind of stuff, I suppose it can apply to as well. And and what are the, what are, you know, what are the kind of tips that you would give people around that? Well, for me, all performance management is like breathing. OK, mm. so no matter what it is, it should be like breathing. So um, it's it's talking about things before they become a thing. And that's where most people fall down. It's already a thing when they want to have the conversation. So I would strip it right back and um, and separate the two. So what I do when I'm performance managing somebody with, say, emotional um, mental health difficulties or anything like that, I separate out the two processes and deal with them in parallel. So you've got the, the process of performance management where you're kind and clear. you can't be kind when you're managing performance. I think that this is a, that there's this fallacy that it's this horrible environment. It's for me, it's where you support somebody, you understand them, but you also say, this isn't good enough. You know? Yeah. 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 And I'm sorry, it's not good enough, but it's not, but here, how can we help you get there? So I would do, always do the two in parallel where you're setting the expectations, but also giving so much support like so much um and i would do the two in parallel uh, also i'm a huge fan of having an eap an employee assistance program it yeah. was the first thing i managed to get rim to spend money on on people when i started and it, i mean really it was it was small it was like ten thousand for the year for the amount of employees we had at the time but for a hr person like it's it's we offer it all the time to everybody. And actually one of our guys wrote a beautiful letter. He asked me to share with the company anonymously because he'd been suicidal and wow. he used our EAP and he wanted the, the company to know, um, you've got to reach out to these guys. Like they will help you, you know? Um, mm. So it's really important to me to have that EAP that we can offer that really proper, you know, I'm a coach, I'm not a counselor. So I really want to make sure I've got that right support yeah. alongside yeah, yeah. me when I'm helping uh, somebody through a, a performance issue that might be linked to something very emotional. Yeah, yeah. No, that's incredible. Absolutely, it's powerful stuff really, isn't it? Yeah. Um, Steph, is there anything else that you wanted to share today? Just conscious of time here. We've been talking for a long time, but I mean, <laughs> we could probably talk for hours, the two of us. <laughs> uh, no, I think, 
I think we've covered it all. Today. <laughs> <laughs> That's it for today. <laughs> Lesson over. Thank you for coming to my TED talk and all the rest. Um, brilliant. And uh, the question. So I've kind of, you know, yourself, I've, I've kind of mixed it up slightly and talking more in the context of when I say happier at work, what comes up for you? What does that actually mean for you? Yeah. So for me, it's two things. It's like a macro thing and a micro thing. So let's go macro. So for me, company, purpose and meaning. Now, I will say I can find meaning in anything. I always say I'm like that, that the kid in Sixth Sense that can see dead people. I see I can find meaning and purpose in everything. I find it we're, very we're, easy. I think as but as humans, I think we're meaning making machines, aren't we? Like we turn everything to have some sort of a meaning. I can find meaning in everything. So I find meaning say if you're having a bad day, I will find meaning in a meeting. I will say, okay, I want to achieve this. I want a person to feel like this at the end of it, that I can get my meaning kick right there. And then it doesn't have to be huge, you know? So I, 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 I obviously like quite a big meaning and that's why I set up step B, but I get it. I can find it. Right. So, but company meaning purpose is important. Um, trust is a really big one for me. So I'm really interested in the elements of trust, how to build mm. trust. Um, and, and yeah, I'd actively kind of, I suppose research and um I suppose one thing I like to do just to go back to what we we're talking about earlier on I love to take these fluffy things and turn them into implementable yeah you know, actions yeah. right yes so that's yeah. what I really love to do right yeah. that is how do we take that and make that really clear concise and how it'll actually make a difference to your day you're, so speak, the same you're speaking my language now Steph <laughs> So I do the exact same with trust. What is trust? How do we break it down? How mm. do we um, make each element of it better? And yeah. really it always comes back to me, doesn't it? What I do. So trust is big. Belonging, which we talked about at length. Um, yeah. Being in a company that does the right thing, which again, I'm lucky I've worked in two companies where we try to do the right thing all the time. Um, being allowed to do what I'm good at instead of pigeonholed. I worked for one company where I was doing something I was very bad at and I was miserable and they weren't happy with me either. And we literally just changed my job around a bit. And people were telling me how I flowered. Now, this is when I was, you know, it was my very, very early days where I was a HR admin, but literally people were saying how I flowered. And I was like, God, I was doing, I, I didn't know at the time because I hadn't done this education, but I was like, I was doing the wrong thing, you know, yeah. sitting in the corner working on spreadsheets. Yeah. Don't make Steph a happy girl. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and then mattering, being told that I matter. And, and yeah. I don't need to be told it, but I, I know by when I work with people that I matter. So, and then I suppose another thing in macro is that true diversity and equality, um, you know, where it's in the DNA, it's not a forced thing. So they're the macro things, but then micro, um, internal meaning, uh, perspective, uh, that thing I talked about earlier, having a baseline of positivity and resilience and, and mindset. So they're the things that come up for me as a, on a micro, how I make sure that my happiness, um, and I, I put my happiness very high on my list because I know um, somebody said to me one time when they saw me with my little girl when she was tiny, she was such a, she still is, she's a real fun little thing. And she was sort of flirting with everybody in the restaurant. She was like a year and a half. <laughs> yeah. And they came over to me and they were like, oh, your baby's so lovely. I was like, thanks so much. And they were like, you know, happy mommy, happy baby. And I believe that my whole life, happy me, mm. happy team, happy, yeah. me, happy husband, happy me, happy daughter. So I actually put my happiness probably higher than a lot of women do. But I know that that makes a difference to everybody around me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so I think, yeah, I think that probably covers it up. I'll think of 10 things later, Eva. <laughs> <laughs> this is it, isn't it? Yeah, you're like, oh, I should have said this and I should have said that. <laughs> um, no, brilliant. Absolutely loved our chat today, Steph. And if people want to reach out and co connect with you, what's the best way they can do that or find out a little bit more about Retail in Motion and Steph B, what's the best way? So Retail in Motion, our LinkedIn is really active. Um, so you'll find out all about us on LinkedIn and uh, uh, most of our jobs are posted there. We have loads of jobs at the moment, so please do check us out. Um, I've actually got three in my team. So anybody wow. can join a really, really lovely HR team. <laughs> um, I've got three really nice roles there. And then for Steph B, uh, Instagram is where I'm the most active um, and where I'm so the most free <laughs> what I talk about. <laughs> Um, I'm a little bit more professional on LinkedIn. So I'm on LinkedIn, but Instagram is probably the best place to get me. And I have a website as well. So if you'd like to reach out, um, stephb.ie is my website. Brilliant. Love it. Thank you so much for your time today. Probably went on a bit longer than than uh, either of us anticipated, but <laughs> definitely uh, a really, really great chat. And hopefully the listeners took a lot from that as well. Thanks so much, Eva. It was a pleasure.